Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Stephanie Cristello. I am the Director of Programming here at Expo Chicago, the International Exposition for Contemporary and Modern Art. Uh, welcome to our seventh edition. I'm also the Editor-in-Chief of The Scene Journal, which uh, each of you have a copy of on your seats if you'd like to take with you. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues is a year-round program of provocative artistic discourse, conversations, and discussions with leading artists, curators, and arts professionals on the current issues that engage them. This panel, entitled Militant Eroticism, The Art Positive Archives, features Lola Flash, an artist, activist, and nightclub impresario in conversation with Dr. Daniel Berger, who recently curated the David Vajnarovich Flesh of My Flesh exhibition at Iceberg Projects and is a leading HIV physician in the United States, alongside John Neff, an artist, curator, and educator, as well as founding board member at Iceberg Projects. Berger and Neff are the co-editors of Militant Eroticism, The Art Positive Archives, which was published by Sternberg Press in December of 2017. And this panel discussion will be followed by a book signing uh, with all three of our panelists just to the right of the dialogue stage run by Sector 2337. Um, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Dan Berger, and um, I and my uh, co-editor, uh, John Neff, are going to be talking a little bit about our book. But we're going to be highlighting uh, Lola Flash, who uh, was a key person uh, going back in time uh, during the early days of the uh, AIDS epidemic. And you know, for many of you um, that may not have been around, um, those early days are not unlike the days that we're looking at now, where um, activists had to fight um, misogyny and racism and homophobia and AIDS phobia um, like we're fighting today. Um, and if, and you know, going back and harkening back to those early days, you know, the AIDS epidemic began in the early 80s. Um, in 1981, there was the first diagnosed case. Um, in 1983, um, an AIDS ward opened up in San Francisco General Hospital and not so soon thereafter, uh, an AIDS ward, um, we opened up an AIDS ward here in Chicago at Illinois Masonic Medical Center um, and um, where I was seeing patients uh, at the time. Um, in, 80, in 1987, ACT UP uh, was already um, organized and they did their first demonstration at Wall Street. Um, in, and then um, in the same year, 1987, um, the artist photographer Peter Hujarp dies of AIDS-related complications. Um, then in 1989, Art Positive forms, and Art Positive um, was uh, a very key uh, affinity group that was formed out of um, many of the members of ACT UP, and those uh, members included uh, Lola Flash, but also uh, Zoe Leonard, Nan Golden, uh, David Wonrovich, Hunter Reynolds, uh, Aldo Hernandez, uh, Ray Navarro, among many others. And um, they formed um, the group because there was a, uh, there was a um, the possibility that funding was going to be uh, taken away from uh, the NEA. And uh, in front of Congress was Jesse Helms and other people. They were proponents working with uh, the American Family Association. And they were going to withdraw funding for artists. And artists such as uh, Maplethorpe and David Wonorovich and uh, Serrano, um, they, were, they were all being censored at the time. And around that same time, um, there was a, an interview um, in Vanity Fair magazine. Um, Mark Kastabi, the artist, um, was given a very large platform uh, interview. And in that interview, he states and I can't uh, quote it exactly off the top of my head, but he basically says that, uh, that the art world is being controlled by, uh, by gay people and it's good that they're dying uh, because other people should be uh, taking over the reins, so to speak. 
And there's, uh, it's actually these museum curators that are for the most part homosexual, have controlled the art world in the 80s. Now they're all dying of AIDS. And although I think it's sad, I know it's for the better because homosexual men are not actively participating in the perpetuation of human life, which is just, just a stunning uh, quote, unfortunately. Um, so that's, um, so out of rage and out of, um, and, and the struggle for survival, um, Art Positive began. And, and John, um, John and I, um, we were able to mount an exhibition of the archives of Art Positive. I, um, I, I had recently acquired it in, uh, about two and a half, three years ago. And John, why don't you talk a little bit about, uh, about those archives? Well, first, Lola, anything else by way of introduction? Um, I'm just really so thankful for you guys coming, and also um, that, Dan, that you acquired the collection, because um, as most of you know, the, his story is often, um, um, often leaves out stories around um, people like me. And uh, I think that a lot of people know about our uh, ACT UP, but I don't think a lot of people knew about what Art Positive did. And we were mostly people of color. Um, and uh, in, in addition to the art, we were also concerned about um, issues around uh, the women in col of color who were HIV positive and who didn't have, um, who were mostly straight and had kids and couldn't get to clinics to, you know, for health care um, because they had kids and, you know, so there were a lot of other kinds of issues that weren't being sort of exposed. So those are some of the other things that um, Art Positive did. Great. And as you said, Art Positive until relatively recently was a lesser known affinity group of ACT UP. Um, when we use that word or that phrase affinity group, What's meant by that? I suppose affinity group, like nowadays, it would be called like a special interest group. <laughs> um, but we had lots of different ones. And it seemed like every day uh, there was another one that, that popped up. So uh, there was like La Casina. And they sort of focused on Latinx um, community issues. Um, there was the Women's Caucus, which was like an affinity group, which um, I think in some ways that helped us bond because there, was more, there were more men in the group. Um, but also there were issues specifically uh, pertaining to women that we worked with. So under the umbrella of ACT UP as an organization, there were several smaller organizations that uh, you characterize as special interest groups. The time, at the time, the idea was affinity, affinity groups. And was affinity kind of an organizing principle too, rather than a formal set of rules and regulations about how those groups came together? Well, I mean, I think the whole way that ACT UP worked was whatever your specialty was, that's what you did. And there weren't, there was everything, everything was sort of like on the same level. So if you were like a club kid and you'd go out and uh, give condoms out at, cl at clubs, that was just as important as the scientists that were working. You know, we had a lot of people that were working in television and that's how one of the demonstration, uh, we got into the, the news station because uh, they, they made these fake uh, IDs. And so there were lots of people that were kind of, I suppose, sort of infiltrators in a way, that people that you know, had jobs in different places, and they were able to bring us in. OK. Yeah. Great. Did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but the affinity groups, I mean, for all of you to understand a little bit more, um, members of ACT UP, they could belong to one affinity group, or they could belong to several at the same time. And the affinity groups, although many of them, like Art Positive, staged their own demonstrations, but they also participated in the larger demonstrations that ACT UP was coordinating. But each affinity group had their own purpose or their own practice during those demestrations. Right, thanks for reminding me. So yeah. we would do, um, so we would also make particular posters and, and um, you know, like one time I remember we made uh, these boxes that, that, that people were sitting in these sort of like cardboard boxes that kind of were painted speaking to people needing um, housing. Um, so yeah, so we would bring together sort of our own, own kind of armor with our own special interests. Yeah. And I remember going to meetings, you know, the meetings I think were on Mondays, and then, you know, throughout the week you'd have these affinity group meetings. And I remember always thinking, okay, you're not going to sign up for another group, you're not going to sign up for another group, but, you know, one was compelled to, you know, it was such an urgent time, you know, it wasn't like you would say, oh, I'll do that next week, you know, because it wasn't that kind of time. You had to do things right then and there. So, um, yeah, so it's really true. You know, yeah. you had, you know, 
lots of different things, different groups that you were part of, and it was um, very harrowing. Well, um, we, we, when talking about this time and, and this subject, it becomes easy to go off in all kinds of different directions, and, and I think that's fantastic. And so I'm, I'm not going to try to hew to my, my mind wants to hew to the slide order, but I'm going to float. Mm -hmm. Just to say that this is an um, uh, uh, installation image from the exhibition of the uh, Art Positive Archives that Dan and I staged in 2015. You can see in the lower left-hand corner two of the boxes that the archives were stored in for many, many years after they were assembled by our positive member, uh, Hunter Reynolds. So 2015 was the first time that those archives had been presented in many, many years. I think they went into storage in 94. Here's a brief list of, of some of the characteristics of our positive. I think we've dis discussed most of those. Uh, I just want to mention another affinity group that some people might be familiar with. Uh, through art history courses, museum exhibitions, uh, Grand Fury, uh, which was an affinity group with uh, members including Donald Moffat, Avron uh, Finkelstein, Tom Kalin, Tom Kalin, um, much better known. Uh, but Lola, I wanted to show this picture because I think it goes to the sense of urgency that you were just talking about. When, when I asked you about your outfit here, you said you were a what was the phrase? A soldier, a soldier in the army of love. Soldier in the army of love. Yeah. So I think this says not, something not only about the visual culture of New York at the time that we're talking about, um, that places all the posters and agitprop of uh, art positive in a, in a context that's pretty mainstream, but also the attitude that you're mm. talking about, being a soldier of love. Yeah, well, we were warriors, and um, that was sort of my standard look. Um, this was probably 89 or 88. Right. and. Um, yeah, I mean, and then when I went to demos, I would always have some kind of, you know, military look about it. Um, and uh, I do feel like it was like a war that we were at. But also there was this, this love for each other. Um, ACT UP really, I think that ACT UP really helped bring all of us together, all of us queer folks together. I mean, there were some people who were not queer, but um, for the queers back then, you know, it was like the boy bar and the girl bar, and there wasn't really a lot of mixing. And I think that that was another beautiful thing that happened with ACT UP was that we were able to uh, find a common cause to, to sort of come yeah. together with. But that army of lovers, um, that word was also the name of an exhibition that was at PS122. But they called it an army of lovers because sort of like referencing uh, what uh, scholar Deborah Levine called prosthetic politics, that a lot of people with HIV AIDS were too sick to go to protests. They were too sick at times to be able to participate. So their lovers took their place. They acted as their prosthetics. They mm -hmm. took care of their loved ones at home. And they also were out there protesting uh, in the struggle to survive, in the struggle to try to get access to medical care, access to food, you know, things, things like that. Yeah, and it was a real, um, again, this, this urgency was real, you know. Um, like I said, one minute, one, one minute you'd be at the, the, the big meeting, the big academic meeting, then you'd be in a, an affinity group, then you would be at the hospital visiting someone that was dying, and, or you'd be at the funeral of someone who had died, you know, and it was just this cycle um, now there seems to be more talk about um, AIDS, that whole, that whole era, and um, I, a lot of it I forget, so I don't know if it's like a conscious kind of like denial, or um, um, I feel like during that time I was, I wasn't even able to contextualize the work I was doing or just really what I was doing. It was just kind of like feeling like this like little you know, hamster in a, you know, one of those little sort of things, you know, it's just uh, this constant, constant on the go and trying to keep your emotions in check so that you could do do some good work. And That's you were really doing photographic image. work the whole time. Could yeah. you talk a little bit about some of these yeah. can, images? Yeah, can we go back to Charles? This one? So this one was, um, um, this is my friend Charles who, um, sadly enough, I didn't realize he was actually HIV positive at the time. Um, I started off knowing that um, if I, he was dark skin, so if I put, you know, those round uh, band-aids on him that when I made my print, it would look like Carposis. And Carposis is something that um, a lot of uh, P 
people who were HIV positive had in the very beginning. It was like a skin cancer? Yeah, it was yeah. a skin cancer, but it, it, well, it manifested on the skin, so people had it. You know, you could walk on the streets or look in the bars, and there are people that had those purple spots on their face or on their skin. But it, it does tend to invade the intestines. It can invade the lungs. It can lead to someone's death. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a skin cancer, but it can become systemic. And it also created this shame for a lot of people who had it. You know, it was, it was like this visual reminder that these people were HIV positive. Um, but it was kind of like this attack on the Band-Aids, because Band-Aids back then, um, you know, you couldn't get like a Mickey Mouse Band-Aids back then. There was always that odd color that really didn't match anyone, and particularly like black people's skin. And so um, it was kind of like Band-Aids and Band-Aids, you know, kind of a play on, the, on those words. Um, and then sadly, I realized he, I found out that he was positive and he died. Um, this is a self-portrait. Um, and that AIDS is killing artists, now homophobia is killing art, was one of the, uh, the t-shirts that we made. And I just kind of bunched it up and put it on that background. Um, you know, the idea of laying down. Um, yeah. And what's, what's that in the upper left-hand corner? The A House um, is a very um, old place, a uh, bar in um, Provincetown. And um, yeah, so that was like a place where a lot of guys went. And so I kind of put that there in, in their memory. Yeah. And here's that uh, a poster that was made at around the time of our positives first meeting. Uh, and as Dan mentioned, that quotation from Kastabi and Vanity Fair was one of the um, spurs to action to form this affinity group art positive. Um, some of their other actions, um, I'll let you guys talk about those a little yeah. bit. Yeah, this is our positive, uh, a staged uh, a protest in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There were about 2,000 people that participated with artists such as Leon Golub, Nancy Spiro was there speaking. Um, the police were there trying to, uh, you know, trying to keep things under control. But um, they, this, was, uh, this was formed right around the time that Jesse Elms um, put forth his proposed amendment to withdraw funding from the National Endowment of the Arts. So there was a huge protest in front of the Met. There was also protest around uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. St. Paul's right? Cathedral. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Ray, uh, Ray Navarro, who was one of our, our sort of king warriors, I suppose, or kingpins. Let's move forward to him. Uh. Well, I actually. Lola, if you don't mind, um, uh, this uh, image, you said this was from the ACT UP protest at the NIH, the National yeah. Institutes of Health. Yeah. You said something when we were talking about this the other day about your photographic technique at the time and, and one of the ways that related to some of the subject matter you were dealing with. Could you talk a little bit about the way you were taking pictures and what that meant to you at the time? Yeah, so um, when I was in college, I came up with this idea of cross color. And um, the short story is that, um, I realized that by changing everything, so you know, um, this was before computers, and so I was in the dark room using the wrong paper, basically. And um, my teachers were like, what are you doing, Lola? And uh, at the time, I didn't really know. I, 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 resp I was responding to the colors. And then I started thinking about, I'm changing everything around, or I'm reversing things. So black is white, white is black. And uh, when I, growing up, I was a little bit of a nerd, and I used to love uh, looking through the dictionary and hanging out in the library. You know, and at a young age, I learned that black was bad and white was good. You know, black was dirty and white was pure, you know. And um, growing up as a little black girl, you know, it's kind of unnerving, and it doesn't go away. Um, so I realized that in my pictures, you know, uh, Again, I don't know if you guys know this reference, but uh, there was a time when uh, Kodak, had, Kodak had this advertisement that said, um, it's like a beautiful Kodak day. And it had a family of white people with blonde hair and this little girl, little baby girl running along and a, a dog pulling at her, her, uh, her uh, diapers. And so the sky is blue, you know, the, the clouds are white. And yeah, it looks like a beautiful day. Not my family portrait, but. Right. Looks like a beautiful day. <laughs> so, in my pictures, this is a beautiful Kodak day, right? Orange is the back of blue. Uh, orange is the opposite of blue. Um, white obviously is opposite of black. And so, it you know, I felt like this work really spoke to the, all the kind of anger and danger 
um, distress, all those kinds of words. Um, and so, yeah, so for 20 years I sort of did this kind of work. And after a while I kind of realized that not only could I make white people black and black people white, I could make them green and purple. And so then it came, became more about the form. And you know, this, this whole sort of uh, idea of race is all made up, right? So I was able to kind of change it change the narrative, yeah. make it right. Yeah. And one, of the, one interesting thing is there's, um, on one of the posters it says, um, one, it says the government has, <coughs> has blood on its hands, one aid's death every half hour. Mm -hmm. um, that was back in the day. For any of you that may not know this, but even today, if you're African American, you identify as a gay male, you have a 50% chance of contracting the HIV virus during your lifetime. Before so one out of every, and that's currently, that's what the CDC recently released those statistics. So if you're African American gay, you have a 50% chance of getting HIV disease in your lifetime now. Yeah. Also, this, that, that, um, that was also stickers, and um, it actually changed. You know, it was like every uh, 15 minutes that that rate changed. Yes. Yeah, it got more. Yeah, one person died every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, out, uh, somewhat out of order, there's another uh, art positive action in an artwork by uh, Hunter Reynolds and a list of some of the programs. Aldo, actually Aldo did this. Aldo Hernandez, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, uh, a list of some of the exhibitions and programs uh, within the art world that art positive participated in. Uh, here is another image of the exhibition in 2015, which was divided into two parts. One part of the exhibition uh, recapitulated this uh, show uh, curated by our positive at PS122 called An Army of Lovers and brought together for the first time elements of this David Von Arowicz, uh map piece on the far right-hand side here, as well as original uh, didactic information from the Army of Lovers show, including this essay by Ray Navarro Here's Aldo and, yeah, and, me. Yeah, and you yeah. at, uh, an, at Army of Lovers, right? Yes, yep. yeah. And then uh, it also uh, was the occasion for the exhibition of this piece on the right by artist Ray Navarro called Equipped. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about Ray. Here's a close-up of Equipped. I'd also like to talk a little bit about the way that a lot of the work that y'all in Art Positive did mixed that deadly seriousness, that toxic sky, for example, in the NIH photograph with a kind of play. You talked about making people purple, making them green or blue. Mm -hmm. And that's in this piece too, I think, humor and play. Well, this piece was photographed by Zoe Leonard. Um, at the time, um, it's Ray's piece, but at the time, I believe Ray was, uh, Ray Navarro was um, almost blind at that and point. CMV, I believe, yeah. Yeah, and um, he was sometimes, um, lucid and sometimes not so lucid. Um, but he, you know, again, he was like a warrior till the end, you know, he didn't, uh, he was still making work, he was in a wheelchair and, you know, he was able to find humor. But I mean, I think that from my point of view, if you're an oppressed person, you know that uh, you have to laugh or else they're gonna get you, right. you know what I mean? So I think it's something that people um, that are oppressed use as a, as a vehicle to, to keep on keeping on. Right. You know? Here's another instance of that, uh, that flesh color, quote unquote flesh color you were talking about too, the uh, Hollywood beach frames around these photographs, shot by Zoe Leonard for Ray at his instruction because he was then blind. And this, Dan, is an example of that prosthetic effect you were talking right. about. Mm -hmm. Prosthetic politics. And, and it should be noted also that um, this was done uh, relatively um, late uh, for Ray Navarro, who was dying. Uh, this was done um, by Zoe Leonard, and an essay um, for Army of Lovers was dictated uh, to Aldo by Ray in the hospital bed. In the hospital bed, and actually the day that uh, the exhibition opened in 1990, Ray Navarro actually dies. So. Yeah, you know, so there's that, there's, ex there's yeah. that exhibition. And these are all beautifully portrayed in, in our book. You know, you're free to look at after, after this presentation. And there another is. instance of that, and that's that Ray. humor, yeah. Ray at St. Patrick's Cathedral posing as Jesus Christ and asking parishioners as they exit the cathedral 
what they think of the Catholic Church's policies on sex education. Yeah, abstinence as opposed to using safe sex practices. And there he is again. There's Ray on the end, um, Leon Mostavoy, and Greg Hubbard. Um, so this was a series called. Um, well, you had it. It was no you were doing. You're posing people at different sites. This was in front of the U.S. Post Office. AIDS Warriors. So yes. it was in there. Yeah. Um, so this was called AIDS Warriors, and yeah. So I was attacking all the institutions because back in those days, you know, even the New York Times never had any kind of reportage on the front page, um, and it, I was put, so I, I did you know shoot in front of, in front of Times. This one was um, asking for uh, an AIDS stamp, which you know in hindsight or now you know there's been lots of different aid stamps. Um, but what we actually did was, um, this is the side of a truck, and you can see all our little stickers. You can even see the, um, the, the ones that were bigger in the poster. Um, and so we, we went on one side of the, of the truck. We quickly stickered it up, and then I was like, OK, you guys, strike a pose. And we took like a couple of shots, and then we, we ran. Yeah, and the stickers know? were, you know, if you can't see the pink triangle with uh, sound sequence death. death. Yeah. So they were, you know, they were pasted all over the. Um, I wonder what the uh, post office driver thought about when he came outside and looked at his truck with all those yeah. stickers on it. Yeah. Would have been a great moment. <laughs> Just to catch, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, the thing about the cross color uh, process that I used, these were all um, um, just water guns, but there was something about the way that you know, by changing the colors, it, they kind of looked sort of real. Right. You know what I mean? And I think for me, it was more like. They were protecting. It wasn't like they were, you know, sort of shooting. It was more about like sort of protecting this idea. And this is another of your photographs, obviously, but uh, referring back to Ray's work, right? Yeah. Well, no. This was um, this is called for Ray because um, I used to spend a lot of time in Provincetown, and uh, one summer, it was the summer after Ray had passed away. Um, and I was sitting on the beach. I see this wheelchair at the top of this hill. And I was like, who's, who's you know, I didn't see anyone differently abled. And um, even though it's just a wheelchair, I always like to ask permission to shoot. That's the kind of photographer that I am. And um, I couldn't find anyone. And so I sat there thinking, hmm, I want to take a picture of this. And I did, and I thought, you know, I bet you it's Ray. I bet you d Ray decided that he wanted to come spend a day on the beach with me, and so he's come back here in this form, you know. So it's, you know, an artist we can make our own narratives, and that's that's my that's my story. I'm I'm sticking with it. Yeah. So that's for Ray. Um, this was, I, I believe, this was the first time that the AIDS quilt was um, displayed in in Washington D.C. Um, and uh, you guys can see it says flash there in the corner. Um, it was my first experience walking around on the, the quilt. And I don't know if any of you guys have been, had the, the uh, chance to go on it, um, or walk around it. It was really um, a very emotional experience. And when I saw flash, it just kind of stopped me in my tracks, you know. And I, of course, I always was kind of aware that this could be me. You know, um, and if I had a different type of life, um, it could have been me. And so, um, I just really like the way that the shadows of the people kind of are laying on the quilt, and that you can't really see anyone's faces. They're sort of, uh, you don't really know who they are, but they're, you know, they almost feel like ghosts of the people that are on the quilt. Um, but it was a project that was um, pretty monumental, and. Uh, Several years down the road, it was so expon exponentially like big that it was overwhelming, really, really overwhelming. I think I that might have been the first and last time I walked around one of those because it was just, you know, you felt like you got you were getting trapped inside of this maze of death. It was a lot. Do you want to add anything about the quilt or this? I believe was shot at the NIH. I think it was protest. the same time yeah. when I was yeah. at the yeah. NIH. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, uh, just to echo what Lola was saying, uh, even even uh, during the exhibition of Art Aids America, they had portions of the quilt, and you know, it's even wa looking at it today, um, you can't help but become overcome by emotion. 
This uh, is the, um, the flags um, the, um, that were created uh, for an exhibition at Columbia University by Art Positive. And it was a collaborative effort. And on the left is the positive flag. And on the right is the negative flag. The positive flag has many of Lola's images on there. I will have her talk about that. On the right is the negative flag. It has many of the uh, celebrities, politicians, um, people that made racist, homophobic comments, uh, such as Cardinal O'Connor, uh, you know, Cardinal or um, Jesse or Helms, Jesse Helms, and uh, and um, D'Amato, uh, yeah, Dan Bush, Land. and Reagan, and uh, and um, uh, D'Amato, and uh, and many 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 people uh, are on that. But anyhow, Lola, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, your work on that positive flag? Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Um, so when, when we worked uh, with Art Positive, it was uh, you know, this affinity group. And so although I took the pictures, it was um, you know, in the sort of name of the group. Right? So it's, um, don't think of it as my work, but it, it is my work. <laughs> um, so there's pictures like. Um, here, that's, that's me and Julie, my, my, my partner at the time. Julie um, Tolentino. Julie Tolentino. Um, these two guys, I don't know if you can see these two penises here. They're like, I used to do a lot of photograph for, photographing for um, Quick, Quick, which was a boys club. So I did all the posters for it. So it's kind of, um, you know, there's some pictures here. There's Peter Staley, um, who was uh, you know, one of the sort of well-known people in ACT UP. So I think, I think this was from the, um, the church demonstration, I believe. Yeah, Stop the Church in front Stop of the church, St. Yeah. Patrick's Cathedral. So there are various things. You know, there's Julie up there with her hands up. Um, there's some Keith Haring from the Keith Haring bathroom at the, uh, at the center, LGBTQ center. Um, so there's just various sort of images that, that we decided to use. And um, I'm talking to Aldo about it. You know, we sort of like, there were a few shots that were like purposely built, uh, shot for it, and then there were just some stuff that we thought that would be work work with it. You know, I printed it in uh, all red, uh, in the uh, so in the dark room there was a way to like use. I think I made a lot. You put a lot, dry a lot of green in, and it, everything comes out kind of red. I don't know. I've got it all written down, but um, I was I made the, all the red hue so it would sort of imitate the flag, um, <coughs> and um, yeah, that's pretty much that. I I. Uh, you know, Dan has it in, in his downstairs, uh, his lower level, and uh, Friday was the first time I had seen it. Um, and it was, um, I was surprised, I, I kind of got a little teary. I think it maybe it uh, just reminded me of the time. It really just kind of visually took me back to that, to that time. Um, but it also just made me realize, how, you know, how thankful I am to you, to that, you, uh, that you're keeping the, the stories alive. Uh, this is another one of uh, Art Positive's um, group projects from 1990, 1989, 1990. Um, they funded a lot of their actions through the sale of T-shirts like the one that you saw in that second or third photograph, the self-portrait of Lola's, and also calendars. This calendar gives us the title for the exhibition catalog, Militant Eroticism. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the calendar or how that was an example of your collaborative working process? Yeah, well, actually, that's how I, I met Aldo. I over, I was in a show in, um, in Brooklyn, I believe, and I over, for some reason at that time, I really wanted to be in calendars. I don't know, you know, we all have our faces, so I wanted to be in calendars. And so I overheard him saying, oh, yeah, I'm still looking for a few, few more people. And so I was like, excuse me, sir, you know, I've got some work here. And so um, from that day on, we, Aldo and I became friends. And um, in fact, I think that, that calendar, I got the front and the back. Um, but one of the things that was great, besides the fact that there was, um, you know, 12 different artists every time that we did a, a calendar, um, there was also, and I think Aldo did most of the work, each day kind of either rep said something about maybe someone who had died, maybe something to do with some statistics around HIV. Right. So each day sort of had something very significant and special. And we didn't have computers back then, too, so I don't really know how he did that. Dan's got a lot of favorites <laughs> from the, the daily records. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, in the calendar, there's a really beautiful. Uh, oh, sorry, just one. This is yeah. Leon Mostovoy's uh, yes. photograph. 
uh, it was Tracy at the time, but now they go by Leon. Yeah, but uh, in the calendar, and many of the images are in our book, but the, we used uh, the David Wonorovich. David, David uh, provided an image for one of the months, and it's a photo montage of someone getting a blowjob in front of the American flag. Uh, and we use that for the insi inside the dust jacket, the uh, front cover of the book. It's uh, it's really it's really quite amazing. Uh, on that note, Lola, yeah. I would just it, it, to to return to what you said earlier about being a soldier of love and the theme of militant eroticism. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, the way that Art Positive as a group pushed sex forward? I mean, y'all really foregrounded the body in, an, in, a, in a way that emphasized eroticism and sex in a very um, difficult time, mm. where often, especially queer bodies, weren't seen as being about desirability or voluptuousness, but were seen as being about disease and death. I mean, could you talk about that a little bit? Mm. I mean, we were all young and having lots of sex, so. <laughs> That could have been part of it. Um, for me, I know I was doing, like I said, I was doing a lot of photography for Quick and also for uh, Julie's club. Actually, Julie Toltino is the one who started the Click Club. Uh, there was like a little typo in the okay. bio. Um, I was there. Um, you know, I drove around the DJs, and the, we had uh, back then we had VCRs, and we would go to the VCR store and get VCRs out, and we took our VCR player to the club. You know, so um, I was definitely one of the many people that helped that club. Um, succeed. Um, so I did a lot of photography for the Click Club. We did s slide shows. What was the Click Club? Okay, so the Click Club was um, one, of a, one of the many, one of the few uh, long-running girls clubs that uh, Julie Tolentino um, started. And um, it was um, a beautiful place because up, up until that time, again, you know, uh, girls of, were kind of segregated. You know, the communities were, it was sort of like the white girl clubs and then the black girl, you know, more, more like home, home parties, house parties. And so um, the Clay Club kind of brought everybody together and they had great DJs and lots of fun, you know, sexy girls. And um, so, I mean, I never really thought about that, but I think that for me with my own work, uh, the cross-collar process was very, um, it was very easy to get people to, to model for me nude. Um, in the guise of, you know, well, you're going to be orange or purple, and people were sort of like more receptive to, to doing more kind of sexy shots, um, knowing that they weren't going to be able to be seen. But, you know, in addition to the, the AIDS crisis, we were, there was also this agenda of, of queer rights, you know, so I'm sure that's also part of the, the need to actually show it and show that it's not some kind of like weird act, that it's just an act of love, like, any other, well, most other sexual encounters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, I think that because of the nature of like where my head was, I didn't really contextualize much. I just was like, okay, we need some sexy shots for the club. Right. Let's get it done and you know what I mean? Just keep it moving. Anything to add, Dan? Uh, just that, um, you know, the community uh, at that time was very well aware of safe sex being very important. <clears throat> and although, um, you know, sexuality was talked about widely because, as Lola said, um, there's nothing dirty about sex. You know, you know sex is a normal, a normal part of our, our life. And, um, and gay men and people and the community is very well aware of how HIV was spread. So safe sex was very much, you know, you'd find condoms uh, anywhere, you know, in the bookstores or... Uh, the bathhouses, the bars, you know, be distributed widely and, um, you know, people were very much about trying to keep people safe, unlike the government that really had no policy in terms of trying to make or alert uh, the public as to how to properly practice safe sex and what was important about that. And I think a lot of, a lot of people today don't appreciate the way that, for example, uh, government actions like the Helms Amendment were directly connected to safe sex education and attempts to defund it. Because if you can't talk about sex using government funding, if you can't show the body using government funding, then you can't educate people about sex. 
Yeah, there's a direct line there. Exactly, and David Juan Roberts was very vocal about that. In fact, he went so far as saying that people like Helms were, uh, they were part and parcel, they were uh, collaborating to murder our community by keeping that information on keeping people safe out of the equation. And uh, was, were these handed out at the Click Club, these Art Positive uh, and Women's Action Committee flyers, Lola? Um, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it would have been a good, a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an example of some yeah. of the educational material you were uh, producing. Right, yes it is. Right. And the Women's Action Committee was another one of those affinity groups of ACT UP, yes. correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, and I mentioned earlier Grand Fury, the today better known um, affinity group of, of ACT UP. Uh, and this is one of their more famous uh, projects. Yes, Maybe yeah. you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, sure. So um, that's me there. Um, I was having a really good hair day, and uh, <laughs> I just kind of went zoop, and it just kind of stayed up there. Um, and that's that's my partner at the time, Julie Tolentino, who we've mentioned a lot lately um, in this in this talk. Um, so the idea was um, back then there was a company called Benetton, and they they had these kind of advertisements. So um, Grand Fury was very smart, and um, they used that kind of like uh, template to make this ad. So I suppose in some ways that it would kind of look like a normal ad, but then when you look closer, you see that it wasn't. Um, we, we all went to an uh, apartment in, in Tribeca and just kissed everyone. We were used to kissing people, you know, just like, you know, I'll kiss you and I'm going to kiss you. It's like, you know, we had demonstrations with kiss-ins, right? Um, and so we, we did this, you know, I, I, Julie and I went together, but it wasn't kind of like, oh, I hope our picture gets, you know, I hope we get to be the couple. You know what I mean? We, I think that there was a lot, um, there was not a lot of ego concerned um, because, again, your friends are dying, right? You're not going to be, it's just there, there was so much more on our plate. Um, so it was nice that we were the couple, you know, ended up being the couple. We, we kissed loads of people before. And, um, you know, even the, um, the straight couple or really gay people just kissing each other. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, it was received. It was it went on the sides of buses, and uh, it was received really well in some places. In Chicago, not so much. Um, so this is Chicago, right? Right. Yeah. This is Chicago. Yeah. yeah. So that's what they thought about us. <laughs> um, but the idea of kissing doesn't kill because people at that time still really didn't understand how people, you know, contracted the disease. And I believe even in some uh, cities where the bus sign went up, the tagline at the bottom was removed. Is that not true? Because it was deemed to convert controversial by some more mainstream really? LGBT organizations? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, again, we, we did this, and then we were on to the next funeral. We were on to the next you know, demonstration. Um, I, when I do talks to like younger people, I'm like, you know, even if we had Instagram, I don't think we'd be sitting around seeing how many likes we got because there just wasn't that kind of time. You know, it wasn't about, it was not about us at all. It was about making sure that people were aware of what was going on, you know. And it, I mean, the similar reasons for what's going on now are the same reasons for, you know, what happened back then. You know, this sort of denial of uh, people of color, of, you know, women, and so. Um, yeah, so it's oh. so it's nice to. I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, I like being able to talk about it and um, you know reminding myself that that was something that I did. Um, my my principal uh, a couple of years back when I was at the school, my principal had that hanging in her in her in her um, dorm room. Mm. You know, so it's kind of neat. They're like, oh, you're that girl. So I guess now in hindsight, it's kind of cool to know that you know my face was that I took the chance to put my face out there to help a cause. You know in hindsight, but at the time it was just like, let's, let's get this done, let's move on. Mm -hmm. And apropos of, of moving on, this is one of the last pictures you made in the States before moving to London, is that mm -hmm. true? Yeah, this was, um, I call it peace, and it's, um, 
I, actually, I had a show recently, and it was near Ray, and I realized how it kind of looks, it kind of works well with, you know, this idea of a chair being there and, and no one's in it. Um, yeah, so from the sort of ni early 90s, when I decided to finally leave America, I um, sort of continued on this idea of loss. Anything else to add about that, that moment, that time? Here's another shot of uh, um, the exhibition that Dan and I curated at uh, Iceberg Projects. And we had a work table in the center of the gallery where the archive was being digitized during the exhibition. Uh, because for both of us, I think, and I think Lola, this is true of you too, it's really important for us to not only talk about that time, but to talk about how it's relevant to the present. and that's. That's something that you do a lot of, and you've done a lot of it too. Here's the uh, piece of Ray Navarro's Equipped that was in the archive at the Bronx Museum, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. What's yeah. happening here? So um, this beautiful piece behind me is a Keith Haring's piece. And um, there was, what was the name of the show? Uh, Art, Art AIDS America. Art AIDS America. I don't know how many of you guys know about that show, but it was, uh, um, it took the curators 10 years to put it together. And somehow they could only find like four artists of color that had responded. Isn't that amazing? I'm just kind of like, really guys? Um, so anyway, what happened was when it first saw, was uh, in I think Maryland, there was a big demonstration, so then, the museums that took the show on later on realized. I'm sorry, Tacoma. Tacoma, Washington. Washington, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was Tacoma, Maryland. How funny. No. no. Okay. It was Tacoma, um, Tacoma, Bronx, Kennesaw, Georgia, where they ran into some troubles with the state legislator, and then here in Chicago, where the exhibition was greatly expanded. Yeah. Right. So um, what they did was they asked. Uh, they they actually at the Bronx Museum they actually just pulled out artists of color work and just smacked it in there as if it had anything to do with the AIDS crisis. Um, and they asked me to come along and, and sort of tell my story. So that was the good part. Um, so I kind of um, made like a special sort of like a, a presentation on, um, on my website actually. And I had everyone, you know, dial into my, computer, my website. So as we went along, I talked about my experience. And so here I was talking about um, the, the, probably the demonstration at the NIH. And um, I talked about how, um, how Keith would, um, so he donated a lot of different uh, works to us for different uh, fundraisers that we did. And um, he, I remember one time at the, so we would have these demonstrations, I mean, these, these meetings as I spoke about earlier. And they would um, be sitting there like you guys. And then there would be like, just chair, there would be no chairs, and you'd be sitting on the floor, leaning up against a column. And I remember one time when uh, Keith Haring came to the meeting, and there was a person with AIDS. We called them PWAs back then, and um, they were coming. They needed a seat. There was no seats, and Keith was very visibly um, sick. You know, he was very gaunt. But he got up and gave his chair to this this guy who was even sicker than him. And I, that always just made me think of like, you know. He was a really great guy, you know, in my, in my mind. So I was telling these sort of personal stories in this. And there, um, I, was, I showed Ray, you know, the picture I did of Ray in front of Ray's pictures. And I think that was just about before I broke down. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, it's, 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 as much as I don't remember, I do remember the pain. And this is more work that you made. We thought we'd end on something uncontroversial. <laughs> more work that you made after leaving the States, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I moved to London really just to, to, I had to get away. You know, I realized that if I kept that pace, that by the time I was like 35, I'd look like I was 95. Um, so I decided that I needed to get away um, from America. And um, this was actually shot in Provincetown. Even though I went away to, to London um, for 12 years, I would come back and forth to P-Town. And um, I shot this in P-Town. <coughs> and this was part of um, a series I called Gay to Z, um, you know, A to Z, Gay to Z. 
and uh, each letter uh, each letter had a picture that represented something. Some of it was comical, some of it was more um, more intense, more political. It was all about me. Um, so this was K is for KKK. I made the hoods. Um, you know, the, the hoods are made of traditionally made out of pillowcases, and I made the hoods. Uh, and I was as I was making them, I was thinking that wow, there's probably someone somewhere here in Massachusetts making their own hoods at the same time. And it was kind of freaky to me just to think of that. So I quickly made them, put the little holes in their eyes, and probably rode my bike to meet these guys in the cemetery in Provincetown. Um, you know, I kind of did the stereotypical, stereotypical thing of like using two sort of muscly guys to, to symbolize gay guys. Um, and um, yeah, so that's, I shot really quickly. The whole thing was very uncomfortable besides the fact that I think they liked each other. So it was, all, it was just all a little bit too much, you know what I mean? So I had to kind of like shoot and then get it done. Um, but what's not so funny is that, you know, it's still, it's, it's we're still, still deal, dealing with that, right? There's still a real schism in the, in the, in the queer community. Um, you know, gay men are men and they make more money than women, right? And so there's still like, you know, sometimes I look at these different events like Pride or recently we had wig stock. And like these tickets go for 100, 200, $300 and these guys can pay for it and you know, it doesn't even bother their, their pockets whereas us women are not making that kind of money. Some women are, but in general, I, I think to myself, why wasn't it that there should always have been like a, like a pay scale for queer events? You know, our brothers should have always been looking out for us, knowing that we don't make that kind of money. You know what I mean? If you can make, if you can pay that hundred, then fine. But if you can't, there should have been something. So, um, so yeah. So now, as a mature artist, you know, I'll be sixty next year. It's like I look at some of the stuff that's changed, which is good, and some of the stuff it came from ACT UP. We, we helped a lot of things change, and it's very empowering to be part of an organization that has changed so much. Um, but as, as most of you all know, I'm sure that there's still, still a lot to, to be changed. Yeah. And this is some of your most recent work, correct? Yeah. So um, my, my work now, I changed from the cross color. I, I went to, um, I did my master's in London, at London College of Printing, and I decided I wanted to do something different. You know, people are always saying, oh, well, you're still doing that work. You know, for about 20 years, I did the cross color, and um, I decided that I wanted to change. Um, it never really got a response. I don't know if it's because um, photography is still kind of a, a, new, um, a new discipline. It's, you know, in, in comparison to all the others. Um, First it was black and white, and then color was like, ooh, you know. So I think the cross color, people just didn't get it. Um, although now it's, it's sort of people are picking up on it. Um, so I went to college at, in London, and I decided to um, start doing normal color. And I can remember my first crit. I was standing there, it was like a blue sky and white clouds, and I was just kind of like, ah, oh, this is, it's like weird, you know, like weird colors. But um, yeah, so now my, my projects are all kind of like, um, I say that each project is, uh, shows a little part of me. So some are about my race, some are about my uh, sexuality, some are about aging. Um, and uh, this one on the left is, is called Surmise. Um, this is Utah. Um, and so Surmise is about, some people think I'm putting people in a box, but it's really about just looking at people and for who they are. You know, people are always saying, um, can I help you, sir? Um, and that's fine. I mean, the only time it really bothers me is when I go to the bathroom. You know, it's just like I just want to go to the bathroom. Don't tell me this is the women's room. You know what I mean? So, um, but so surmise is about people who who present themselves in a certain way. And and unless you want to date them, I don't really see what why it matters if you if that person is queer or not. Um, so there's some straight people that are in this series because, like my two friends who are married they have a lot of gay friends. And when they're hanging out with their gay friends, everyone thinks they're gay. You know, just it's like this um, impulse we have to put everyone into these boxes. Um, so that's what Surmise is about. Um, Utah, she, um, as you can see, she's had top surgery. And we sort of, uh, we met once, and then for a couple of years, we were just sort of like Instagramming and, you know, sort of doing that virtual friendship thing. But I told her when she came to New York, I really wanted to photograph her. So. Um, 
when she came, you know, I didn't really know what pronoun to use. And you know, with her you know, top surgery, I really wasn't sure what was going on. And so I asked her, I was like, you know, so what pronoun do I use? And she's like, she, her. Um, she said that she basically didn't want to navigate life with boobs. And I was like, really? Wow, you can do that? You know, because my generation, we bind, um, or we wear like the tightest bra matchable like I do. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, this, one of the things I do love about the, the internet and the sort of, you know, having this sort of um, dialogues is that you can have more intergener intergenerational conversations and that it is an, it's an interesting to see how, how we move on, you know, and to, to be able to have those, those discourses. Um, this series, Legends, is about, um, so this one has to do with the fact that uh, um, this person, an actor, um, I went up to them at a, par at a club and um, it was, I was going to see this really, it was Joe's Pub and I was going to see one of my favorite actors or performances. And so I just went over to them and I was just like, hey, you know, have you seen this? Um, have you seen them perform, blah, blah, blah. And um, they said, um, do I know you? <laughs> I was like, blah, 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 blah. And I just kind of like ran back to my table with my tail between my legs. And, you know, I'm kind of, um, I I'm kind of slow in my emotions. Usually it takes me about um, 24 hours to really realize how I'm feeling. And I woke up the next morning and I was just like, she bloody well should know who I am. It's because of people like me that she can walk out on that, you know, TV screen with her dress on, you know, pre presenting herself in the way she wanted to, you know, because this this woman um, is trans. And um, so I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to just make a series of people like myself who have been there um, from the beginning, who really weren't like crusaders. They were just like. You know, even myself, I was just doing what I thought needed to be done, you know. And so there's a lot of people, be them actors, writers, uh, performers, um, that I really want to photograph um, to, to show, like, these are the people. These are, like, the four people, four brothers, four, you know, siblings, I like to say, since it's more, you know, more neutral. Um, but those are the people who are, make it so that you know, the trans kids can have their different selected um, pronouns. Um, those are the people who uh, make it so that even in schools now, kids can choose their pronouns and, you know, dress in the way. I mean, gosh, when I was in school, like, I remember in the very beginning, like, you know, you sort of had to wear dresses all the time. That was just, like, horrifying for me, you know? So, anyway, that's what that series is about, Legends. So, um, so yes, yeah, so each of them. I, I think it's, it almost feels like a little quirk, a quilt. Like all of my work is kind of like a little weaving of all the different bits of uh, about me. John. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.